Pirates. They've been around since the beginning. But what do we really know about them? It's time to start asking questions. I'm Chris Brunt. This is Padre. Hello, people. This is Padre the Podcast. We are very happy to have all of you. Favorite podcast. Let me guess. Circle round. I watch it too. It's a pretty good podcast. But this is also pretty good. Speaking of podcasts, I've mentioned Mark Marin and the WTF pod on the show before. It's no secret that I'm a big fan of his. That's probably the first podcast I ever really got into. And Marin got his start as a podcaster by bringing on guests who he didn't always know well, or even when he did, the one thing that united all of them was that he had a problem with them. Because at some point in the past, he'd been a huge dick to them. And so during the interview, he's getting to know them. He's realizing that, oh, I had them all wrong. And he's basically mending the relationship, which he had harmed by being a dick. And as dramatic and satisfying as that framework was for Mark, this isn't really a strategy that's available to me. Because one of the things that I'm known for is not being a dick. I have a different strategy for steering the ship of Padre in its debut season. And that's to bring on people who, for the most part, I know pretty well. Sometimes very well. Too well. There'll be some exceptions to this, like Keith Gesson in the last episode, who I knew of, but had never met before. But the majority of my guests in this first season of Padre are people that I already have a relationship with and are going to be willing, right off the bat, to open up to me about really private and intimate stuff their experience as parents, and their memories and feelings about their own parents. I got a big one for you today. Mary Carr is on the program. How do I know Mary? Author of The Liars Club? Well, this is a story that spans about 30 years and starts right back when that book was first published. I grew up in a town called League City, Texas, which is halfway between Houston and Galveston on the interstate. Uh, and at the time, it was a pretty small town. It was about 34,000 people. Now it's it's triple that, and it's just become part of the greater blob of, of Houston, the, uh, the city that never ends. But when I was in elementary school, my best friend was a guy named Case Gaglione. He's still my best friend to this day, by the way. But we became best friends when we were in elementary school, and... He had an Aunt Mary that he'd talk about a lot. And one day he said to me, uh, my Aunt Mary's going to come read to our class. I said, wow, okay. So the day of the reading, um, in comes Mary Carr. And she comes to our language arts class, which is in a trailer on the outskirts of the school. And she comes and she sits at the tiny little desk and she read from her brand new memoir, which was, at that time was, I think, number one on the New York Times bestseller list. And it's a memoir of her childhood growing up in East Texas, just outside Port Arthur. And it's about her mom and her dad and her sister and her. And it's an incredible book. It's beautiful. It's funny. It's, um, it's credited with reviving the genre of literary memoir. She was hilarious. She was way too funny and way too real and way too kind of gritty and profane uh, to be in a seventh grade classroom. And yet she still kind of kept it in bounds enough that, you know, it was, it, was, it was good. She knew what she was doing. She read from that book and it was so alive. It was so funny and it was so real. It was amazing to see someone who was sort of from my world, but, but had also, it was like she, she landed from a helicopter and had made this incredible work of art out of a place that I had thought was where art goes to die, right? Sort of small town Texas. Now, that being said, she's from an oil working town on the carcinogen coast, 
much more hard scrabble and hard bitten and blue collar than where we lived, which was close enough to the beach that there were like fucking boats everywhere and close enough to Houston that there were plenty of doctors and lawyers and and close enough to NASA that I think a couple people in our class had like parents who were astronauts. You know, we weren't living out in the country. There weren't too many cows in my hometown. There were a few. But Mary came in like a freight train. She wasn't uh, worried about how she was going to present to a classroom full of seventh graders. She seemed like she was talking to a, a room full of adults and she was hilarious and and magnetic and charismatic. And, and I've known her ever since. I was always around, you know, in this family, I was like, uh, you know, the Owen Wilson character and, and Tenenbaums. Like those, I was always just showing up for dinner. I was always at their house. And whenever Mary came, I made sure I was around and I'd get to hang out with her. And as I got older and I started to want to become a writer and was writing poetry, she was patient and tolerant enough to read my first poems, my horrific, embarrassing, pitiful, 17 year old poems, Mary would read them. And you know, that's how lucky I was as a young writer. I had somebody like Mary Carr looking at my stuff and going, Yeah, you got something here. Keep going. And she'd tell me what to read. She'd send me out to go read, you know, Spanish poets or the surrealists. Or she'd tell me to go get Octavio Paz's book, The Bow and the Liar. And I'd be like, Yeah. And everything she told me to read, I read. So I kind of got like a, a, a Mary Carr poetic education for free as a teenager. And after that, I, I didn't see her a lot. If I was ever swinging through New York City, you know, sometimes we'd meet up and, and hang out for a little bit. But mostly I just would email her things that I was writing, things I was thinking about, questions I had about being a writer. And she was, she always responded. It was just having, it was like having a mentor who was a famous poet personality. I mean, she, you know, her boyfriend was like Steve Martin at the time. Like she had this rarefied life. She knew everybody and everybody knew her, and but she had time for me. She always had time for me. I could always reach out to her and she'd be there. And that just made me feel like I, I must be a little bit special too. You know, maybe I can get somewhere like that one day. Cut to years later, I'm going to Syracuse University for a master's in creative writing, where Mary teaches. So Mary not only got to witness me as a sweet little kid, and me as a awkward, presumptuous teenage poet, but uh, me as a, you know, full-blown alcoholic, spiraling out of control in my mid-twenties. So, she knows me pretty well, too. Now, of course, she's famously in recovery, and at the time, when I was a grad student, she was just publishing her third memoir, Lit, which is about her drinking and her getting sober. So it's like, you know, you're going to class with the fucking Yoda of AA, and I'm in denial about my own alcoholism. It was pretty uncomfortable for me. I'm trying to keep my shit together around her, but I, by that point, I can't really keep my shit together at all. And it's just out of my control at that point. What was it like? Well, drinking had been a lot of fun in the beginning, but the fun had dropped away. I drank every day, and by that point I was blacking out three, four, sometimes five times a week. I was having panic attacks. I was having withdrawal seizures. I was doing a lot of dumb shit, getting in more trouble for it. There was a moment where Mary herself threatened to more or less remove me from the MFA program. And I knew that if I squandered the greatest opportunity that had ever been given to me, I would not recover from that. And mostly, I didn't understand why I felt so afraid of myself all the time. At one time in my second year, I was taking a class with George Saunders. It was his class on the Russian short story. It's the class that he recently turned into a book called A Swim in the Pond in the Rain, 
which is out in paperback now, and it's easily the best book on writing fiction I've ever read. But Mary used to drop into that class from time to time, even though she was this you know distinguished professor. She loved George and she loved to hear him teach. So sometimes she'd just show up and like take a seat with the grad students and sit there and take notes and raise her hand and be a student for a day. And one such day, I get to class late. I know that I smell like a fucking distillery. And there's Mary. And she's sitting in, you know, the student section. And she calls over to me, hey, Brunt, come here, I saved you a seat. You know, right in front of her. And I was wearing a, this t-shirt that I, you know, this stupid t-shirt with a blazer. And I remember that because when I sat down in front of Mary, she reached up and she patted me on the back, gave me a kind of little maternal pat on the back. And I knew that she could just fucking feel the bourbon infused sweat that had soaked through my clothes. And I just, I remember writhing in shame and self-disgust and dread that, oh no, (laughs) now she knows what I was doing last night, early this morning, you know, as if, as if until that moment I had been hiding it well enough that I'm going to get found out. Mm. A little while after that, she calls me into her office. She says, Brunt, Again, it's like 10 o'clock in the morning, so I'm not feeling so great. You know, I've probably thrown up a couple times that morning. She calls me in her office. She goes, Brian, when are you going to get sober? She just looks me dead in the eye and asks me that. And I look at my watch, and I'm trying to be fucking cute. And I go, I happen to be sober right now, Mary Carr. I mean, like, my knees are knocking. I don't fucking know what to say to that. I just get the hell out of there. You know, I had to keep going a little bit. I wasn't quite finished. On March 12th, 2010, I was finished. Nothing in particular had happened. You know, it wasn't like that was the day I, uh, you know, like killed nine people on the highway because I was driving drunk. It It wasn't anything dramatic. It was just that was the morning where my denial broke. That morning, for whatever reason, I knew it like I knew my own name. I was going to die like this. I nearly had. A couple of times, for real. Just in the last year. I was going to die... A drunk's death. And I didn't want to. I had a moment of clarity, and it's like, once you have it, you gotta use it. Because if you don't, you're gonna slip right back into the same cycles of denial and dread and mania that you've been in all this time. I have this moment of clarity and I know I got to do something right now. You know, I have this like, is a window that's rapidly closing. And I was walking through a park in Syracuse up a little hill. I took out my phone and I called Mary Carr. And she picked up right away. She said, hey, what's going on? And I could barely speak. And I said... I can't keep doing this. And she said, doing what, honey? And I'm like whispering now. I'm like, I can't keep drinking. And her voice just melted. She was so tender. She said, oh, honey, you don't have to. You don't ever have to feel this way again. She was right. She was right. That was 12 years ago. And I've never felt like that again. The way I did on that hill that day. Not once. I got sober when I did. Because she was there. Because she picked up the phone. 
And an hour later, two guys showed up to my apartment and took me to my first meeting. And I haven't had a drink since. One of those guys is still my sponsor. And the other one helped me make this episode. Mary saved my life. And that's what that thing is about. And she's to this day, she's a huge part of my recovery and so, so many people's recovery. And she's somebody that I talk to a lot more than just about anybody, about sobriety and addiction and family. Addiction moves through families, up and down the family tree. That's how it spreads. It doesn't, it doesn't randomly select people in the population. It moves through households. And because it's a family problem, it helps to have a family solution. Mary has been that for me. Mary Carr is the author of five books of poetry, the most recent of which, Tropic of Squalor, was long listed for the Pulitzer Prize, as well as three best-selling memoirs. She's a chaired professor of English at Syracuse University. And when the Paris Review launched their Art of Memoir series to go along with their Art of Fiction and Poetry series, goes back like 70 years now, Mary is the first writer they interviewed. She's the number one memoirist on planet Earth. My interview with her is coming up right after this. Thing about me as a little kid? Yes, I do. Can you tell me what? You were um, extremely beautiful. <laughs> Stop. You were. No, you were. You were extremely, extremely beautiful. I was awkward. I had braces and glasses. No, no, no. And teeth. no you were. You were a very beautiful child. Extremely beautiful. Go on. Very brilliant. Very sensitive. Trying to act like you weren't. <laughs> And um, the best thing about you was your humor and your sensitivity and your presence. But you you had struck this, you had this Sicilian godfather thing going on with my mm-hmm. nephew. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, We were mafiosi, the two of us. That's right. That's right. The, the double dons, as I thought of you. Made men. Made at, men. At 14 years old. <laughs> More like 12, y'all were made men. What about, do you remember when I was your student? Do you remember that day when you came to George Saunders' class, the Russian lit class? Yes, I do. I remember how you smelled mostly. (laughs) So not as beautiful as when I was a child? Is that what you're... You were still extremely beautiful. You were still often extremely either drunk or hungover. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's right. Those are the modes. That I toggled those, back those and forth between. Legs. That's right. Yeah. People had said, you know, what are we going to do about Chris? What are we going to do about Chris? And I said, I'm I got afraid- this. <laughs> no, I said, I'm afraid he's going to die. And um, I talked to Case. I went behind your back and talked to your consigliere. Mm-hmm. And he was as despairing as I was, as was Miss Lisa. And then I took matters into my own hands. And what did Lisa think? She was worried about you. We were both worried about you. And I don't even, were Lisa and I in touch then? What year did you get sober? 2010. Yes, we were in touch. We stopped talking after, in 99 after mother died. Mm-hmm. And then the next time we t- stopped talking was t- for good was 2013. Yeah. So this was sort of the tail end of the, the period where y'all were somewhat in touch. What are you working on, Mary? Well, since my sister died um, two years ago, uh, I found myself really kind of cornered by this book. Cornered almost like you're in a ring with a boxer who gets you down in the corner and it's like pound, pummeling you. Mm-hmm. Um, 
as you know, before she died, uh, we hadn't been in touch for seven years. It had always been a very fraught relationship. So, yeah. um, she was my childhood hero. She saved my life in some ways and she was the worst adversary I've ever had in that even though she loved me enormously, she really often, I think, really intended me harm. Mm. And she was a powerful person. So this book isn't like the others. It's not. It's really because for one thing, I'm interviewing people. I'm. Had you never done that before? Not really. I mean, I called mother and said, what year did this happen? Sure. I didn't so much interview her as help me. Is this the chronology? Yeah. No, this was, that was in 1943, not 1950. Obviously you researched the Liars Club. You researched Cherry. You researched Lit. You had to call people. You had to have conversations. No. Or write to people. No, I did not. I called them and notified them what I was working on. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, said, this is what I think will bother you about what I'm thinking of writing. <laughs> so if you have a problem, now is the time to squawk. Uh-huh. Speak now. Speak now. But you've never done this process of sitting, sitting people down and interviewing them and saying, tell me everything you remember about my sister. When was the first time you saw her? What's the, uh, yeah. Do you feel like this process is working? I feel like I'm as confused about her as I've ever been about anybody in my life. I thought I was Mm. confused. I'm even more confused now. Mm. It's a saga. It's complicated. And it's a ghost story. Yeah. It's a ghost story. It's It's a story about the most secretive person I've ever known. Do you think there'll ever be a way that you talk to her through this book? I just had an amazing thing happen. I found all this video, including videos of you and Case at Dooney's party. No. Extremely. There's, vi- there's video of that? Oh, yeah. That is some compromise right there. I know. I've looked at it. Great videos of Dooney telling stories, too. But I had this amazing experience where I've been looking for her in these videos. And mostly it's like the kids or she passes through a lens or it's mother telling a story or it's something. Hmm. And I saw in the little icon, her face circa, maybe she was, it was the eighties. Maybe case was four. So what year were you for? 86. I clicked on that video mm-hmm. and she went like this held her hands up like a girl popping out of a cake. And then she turned her head like this and bit a cuticle. And I held the camera there on her. And then she went like this and swung her head so fast, your little big heavy gold earrings swung. Uh And she looked at me. And I saw her see me. Wow. And it was, I said out loud in my empty apartment, there you are. Mm. And she said, maybe I should go watch a movie. And I said, maybe you should stay right here. Mm-hmm. And she looked at me again and I saw her see me again. And I thought she's been looking for me too. On her side of the dark. God. It was a re- it was a real ghost story. It was time collapsed. Yeah, and uh, we saw to the backs of each other's skulls for a moment in uh, not uh, extraordinary time, not ordinary time, but extraordinary time. Yeah. So yeah, that's what it's like. I mean, it's all I'm haunted. I mean, it's a it's a ghost story, and I'm haunted by her ghost, and. Uh, I hadn't seen her for seven years before she died, and she's been dead two years. So I've been looking for her in a way for nine years. In the past 18 months interviewing people, the depth of her secrecy, so profound. I can't stop thinking about her, and I'm not, I'm not even writing about her. I've only really written about her once since she died, and it like destroyed me to do that. I, caught me completely. I thought it was going to be fine. And then 
I I was working on it and then I read what I wrote and I just broke down like weeping. Like I just I overcome with feelings of grief that hadn't really been possible until I wrote about her. I know. Welcome to my world. That's what I do for a living. Can you believe I do this? Can you believe this is the fourth time I've done it? Yeah. And I'm like, sign me up. Let me in there. So tell me what you remember about Pete Carr. Pete Carr. The thing to remember about my daddy, other than that, I think he was one of the planet's great fathers, hmm. is that he was born in 1910. Yeah. So he was 45 when I was born, but you've got to understand that he grew up in a logging camp and uh, his first job was hauling water to uh, wood haulers, the guys who were out in the woods. So what he had was he had a yoke like oxen had on their necks from end to end with a bucket on each end with a dipper in each bucket. And he would go out in those old piney woods that all across that old red clay. Mm-hmm. East Texas. East Texas, piney woods. 19. A uh, 20. Mm-hmm. I used to bring my dad a big, a big jug of water while he was mowing the lawn in East Texas. And that, that, that was hard because it was a big jug and I was little and I had to carry it. I didn't want to spill it. So right. I can relate. I mean. That's how hard it was for Pete Carr. Yeah. <laughs> Um, that and, you know, Normandy beach and the, you know, and through to Buchenwald, yeah. the Beaten Ar- the Nazis Ar- and forest and liberating yeah. Europe, so exactly. on and so forth. I just got his, his, uh, discharge papers from world war two. He had seven bronze stars with valor citations. What I thought kind of stuff had, do you got to do to get those? Well, the valor, the V for valor is a very big thing. You have to have done something to save a lot of people's lives. Mm -hmm. Uh, If if it had been witnessed, you would have a silver star. I remember that uh, I was his running mate. I was his running partner. Yeah. And he liked to, in my, in my house, my mother was felt to me more dangerous. He felt safe. He felt safe to me. Safer or safe? Safe. Yeah. I never, no, I ne- Daddy never lost his temper. Daddy woke really? up in the same world every day. Uh-uh. Even when he hit somebody, he never lost his temper. <laughs> Even his when temper. he was being violent, he hadn't lost his temper. That is correct. Mm-hmm. It was just like the washing up. It had to be done mm-hmm. to and knock you, somebody out. Did you or Lisa ever get afraid of him? Like seeing him whip somebody's ass? Never. Never was afraid of him. Uh-uh. He spanked me one time that I remember he was holding on to me. I was running around in the circle and then I stopped and I said, go ahead and, and hit me if it makes you feel like a man. <laughs> I must have been about six and he busted out laughing. He never spanked me again. He said, Pokey, I just don't have the heart. And when he and my mother split up, she had left him. Uh, we were we went on vacation, and of course they got a divorce in the middle of the vacation. And Daddy went back to Texas. And Mother bought a bar and a house and married the bartender. Mm-hmm. Um, but when Daddy got ready to go, I zipped myself into his duffel bag. So when he went to put his last shirts in his duffel bags, he un- unzipped the duffel bag, and I was laying in there. And he said, "Get out of there, Pokey! You're, you're going to break a fellow's heart." Oh. He had big tears in his eyes. Oh, God. He was a real... Um, Sweetheart. He was super sweet. So everybody... Rem- Daddy was a badass. I mean... He's, but that's the reputation, right? The lore is that Pete Carr was the, you know, was the toughest son of a bitch in East Texas. When Daddy walked into bars, and David Harmon will tell you this, there were, there were men who fled. <laughs> And then you would hear the screen door slamming out the back door as people ran away. And is that like fearlessness, that kind of like willingness to do violence? Is that just circumstances? Is that what happens when you grow up in, you know, 1910 in a logging camp? Or is there something, you know, is there something different about him? I mean, not every guy who he who was of his generation and of, of that place was necessarily that badass. No, he was a badass. He, there, I mean, the great story about him, there, there are a couple stories I just heard from David Harmon when I was down in Texas 
last week being inducted into the Gulf Coast Hall of Fame. Hmm. The first one I had heard from Daddy, but I, uh, David Harmon had heard the same story from Uncle Crook, who was there, my daddy's youngest brother, and um, on his deathbed. And apparently there was a, a guy came through at the county fair, some big guy from uh, some big boxer, wasn't Archie Moore or anything, but mm-hmm. it was somebody you, whose name you would recognize. Mm-hmm. And if you could stay, I think if you could stay three minutes in it, in there with him, you'd get a dollar. Well, it was one dollar. Nobody would get in the ring. It was two dollars. Nobody get in the ring. When it got up to, I think it was six or seven dollars, which is what they made in a week. Crook Carr said, I heard Pete stand up. I heard those old Brogan shoes hit the floorboards of the bleachers and I heard him stand up. And uh, he walked out, he walked into the, climbed into the ring. He took his shirt off and hung it over the corner post. Daddy started dancing around like, almost like a kangaroo or something, like jumping on his back legs and doing his fist in a circle and going around and around the guy. And the guy's just like looking at him. And the guy swings at daddy and swing, swipes at daddy and swings at daddy. And daddy was super fast. And then he hit him like six or seven times, like bam, 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 bam. Yeah, and, Pete. Uh, Pete, Mm -hmm. what Crook says was the blood flew. He busted his mouth, his, he broke his nose and he, and he blacked both eyes and his chest. There were stripes of blood. He never, he never landed punch on daddy. So it gets to be three minutes and daddy's standing there. He wants his $7. And the guy says, okay, you fought a good fight. I'm calling this a tie. (laughs) Guy's bleeding, and Daddy squares off at the ref. He goes, "Okay, okay," and he takes his hand and says, "You won." So why you though? Why why were you the running buddy and not your big sister? Well, we were losers. We were the losers in the house. Me and Daddy. You know, Mother was really beautiful and very smart, and she worked for the newspaper, and she drank, and she was badass. Mm-hmm. And knew, knew Picasso and lived in New York City. and uh, had, That's right. Uh, she didn't know Picasso, by the way, but she did know de Kooning. Stand corrected. And, and she knew Pollock, so not nobody. And Daddy would say to me, Pokey, let you and me sneak off and get a cherry freeze. Now, I was about six years old before I realized nobody else wanted to come with us to the farm royal to, you know, where the car hop would bring us cherry freezes and some onion rings. But uh, I thought we were doing like this great thing. Yeah. And when he took me to where those guys were drinking and gambling, you know, where they had the big tanks full of menace, you know, you know, I'll go up their little black comma bodies all going this way and all going that way. Mm-hmm. Uh at the bait shop where they played dominoes or they went hunting or anything like that. I just thought that was magic. I felt safe there. I was never scared. I was never bored. They told these great stories and it was, it was understood that I was really spoiled. Like there were no other children, no other women ever came in there, much less a girl, a little girl, little girl, like between the ages of, one, two, three, four. When I got married, uh, my I had you know my girlfriends with me, and Lisa was in the up where I was getting dressed, and Mother was there, still hungover from the night before. I'm sad to say, I stepped into my wedding dress, and all the women were horrified. You're supposed to pull a dress like that over your head, mm-hmm. but Daddy, Daddy dressed me when I was little. Mm-hmm. He didn't dress Lisa. So it was really weird. I just was given to him. I think it was that mother was overwhelmed and I was the baby and I would have been more trouble or something like that. But he didn't see me as troublesome. He saw me as like amusing. But I don't know But why. that means that you had you knew a side of him that they didn't. That y'all had an intimacy that he didn't let Lisa or your mother. They didn't come to the bait shop with him or see him no. around his friends like that. That's right. They they were, you know, I mean, I've been talking to you about my sister. She was ashamed of daddy. Daddy was corny. He was a, he was a hick. Um, But you liked all that stuff, all that Texas exotica, the fishing and hunting and the idioms and the storytelling. I 
I love the language. You know, I love the language. I was just listening to a video of Dunia the other night at that party, one of those Christmas parties he gave that you went to so drunk and almost got yourselves killed. Mm -hmm. In the Um, 90s. In the 90s, we should stipulate. That's right. I think uh, Clinton was still in office when this happened, which means I was a minor. But yeah, continue. Dunia's saying, man, I shook so many hands tonight. My hand's like an old fiddler crab. (laughs) And he says... And then he says, uh, I told so many lies tonight. I sent everybody in this hotel to hell. No. So, I mean, just the language of it, the idiom of it, the um, I'm sending everybody in this in this hotel to hell. You know, you but like two bulldogs in the, a bag. The attitude of it, too. I mean, there's, it's poetic, but it's a it's an attitude. You can't say any of that unless you feel that way. You know, there's a there's a wonderful book you should read that I think explains both Dooney and my daddy by Walter Benjamin, AKA Mm -hmm. Walter Benjamin, if you're uh, an American speaker. Or in the age of mechanical reproduction or something different? No, something different. Mm. Uh, The storyteller. Mm. I don't know that. It's about the nature of story. And it's about um, a certain kind of folk tale that is full of like rogues and thieves and villains and badasses Uh and that has enchantment in it and has mystery. And often there's a trickster type character. The storyteller is often a trickster type character who, you know, there's a guy with a big badass guy comes to a small German town. He's got a big beard and nobody will shave his beard because they're afraid they're going to hurt him and then he'll fight him. And finally this little boy about 10 years old says, I'll shave you. He gets his razor out and the guy says, uh, well, if you nick me, I'll kill you. And the boy says, if I nick you, I'll cut your throat and run away. So in a way, it's their tales all full of violence. Mm-hmm. And they ha- but they have a moral side. What's you know, the moral they, of that one? Um, don't tell somebody what you're going to do. You're going <laughs> to kill them in advance. <laughs> Keep your fucking mouth shut. Keep your mouth shut. Instructions. Uh, these are instructions, these for, are instructions. for survival. But, but all the stories are completely local. And often the stories, I mean, I'll tell you a story, Dooney. I just recorded of Dooney telling. is a perfect example of this kind of story. Benjamin is talking about the difference between an epic and a novel and this kind of folk chronicle. It's a chronicle. It's a completely local set of episodes. Mm -hmm. It's not about history or journalism or information. It's about action. So I said to Dooney as we're driving down the beach road uh, past Sabine Pass, didn't you all catch an alligator on this road here one night? He says, uh, no, we didn't, we didn't catch him. We lassoed him. I said, how did y'all come to lasso an alligator? He says, well, well, the way it started <laughs> was Frankie Crone decided to jump federal bond because he'd been arrested smuggling dope on a shrimp boat. <laughs> now, it wasn't his shrimp boat, but he was on the boat, <laughs> and he was going to jail for, like, forever. <laughs> And he said, so he bailed out and decided to jump federal bond and called me and asked me if I would come to Galveston and get it. So I did. I said, (laughs) isn't Frankie Crone still a fugitive? (laughs) And then he goes, yeah, maybe we better leave that part out. (laughs) And then he says, so me and Joey had pick up Frankie Crone. We're driving back down the beach road. And there's this great big alligator stretched across the road. I said, what do you mean great big? He says, 14 feet. Mm -hmm. He said that asphalt at night retains heat and and the alligators like to lay on it to get warm. So he says, but that's the alligator. He says, I pull my truck right up beside the alligator. The alligator doesn't move. The alligator doesn't slither off or anything. So I get out and I'm looking at him. Joey head and uh, Frankie get out. They're looking at him. And I remember I've got a rope in the truck and I make a lasso and I hand it to Joey, I said, why don't y'all lasso this alligator? <laughs> well, so they throw this lasso over the alligator's head and they get his knot up right under his neck. And he says, the minute they get a hold to him, 
an alligator rears his tail back and hits the side of my truck <laughs> so hard. <laughs> he did about $5,000 worth of body work. He said he hit the way you now the door of a truck will pooch out. He said he goes completely indented with one strike. Like, boom, just wham, just not. He says then he goes into his death roll like they do when they kill something. And he rolls under my truck and he knocks the tailpipes. He knocks the muffler out and he's like switching around. I say, let him go. Let him go. Let that rope drop that rope. So, so they, they drop the rope. And he says, the alligator slithers out, looks around, and he says, it looks like he's got a necktie on because <laughs> he's got a knot under his neck and this long thing hanging down. <laughs> and, he go, and he goes up on his tiptoes, and he looks at us, and he goes, <sighs> and hisses at us like, you freaking losers, like I'm going to kill all of y'all. And then he says he walks off like on his tiptoes, like, like fuck y'all. <laughs> Okay, so the way what makes that this kind of chronicle story is that it it deals completely in the moment, in that place and time. There's no information. Yeah. Uh, minus Frankie Crone bailing out of jail. The backstory of the character who's so there's highly no specific. There are no da- there's no data. Yeah. About anybody. There's also so, like there's there's, a, there's this like articulateness at the exact right time. That that a storyteller like Dooney and I'll bet Pete Carr also had right to know that you know that you have to specify that that asphalt retains heat. That's right. Like that's funnier that's than funnier. the punchline of the story because of how it sits in there as this moment of articulateness amongst all this you know redneck shit, all this wild action and and ridiculous behavior. But the, but so then then the other thing is that often what happens in these stories, the trickster is often bringing medicine or something magic and healing to somebody who's wounded. But there, so in this case, the alligator is this kind of, and I said, so y'all, let me get this straight. Did y'all lasso that alligator because you were afraid he was going to get, get hit by a car? So see, I'm trying to make like a moral story out of it. Yeah. Or at least find logic to it. Exactly. And Dooney says, No, we lassoed him because he was so fucking fine. (laughs) That's why we lassoed him. (laughs) Like, bitch, he was so fucking fine. We just had to lasso him. I mean, that's a good looking gator. I mean, what did you expect us to do? Just keep on driving? Yeah, exactly. He was so fucking fine. (laughs) You know, there's something so beautiful about that story, isn't there? Yeah. That's how daddy talked. That is how daddy talked. Cold in that boxcar. I'll tell you how cold. It was like a razor blade come inching up between them floor blades. How could you not be a writer? You know? How could I not be a writer? And you center that, right? The Liars Club as, you know, it's the set piece. It's the framing device for the whole memoir of your childhood. But it's also the place, right? It's the community. It's the society of, of, your, of your father's friends. It's the society I grew up in, which I'm still trying to puzzle out. Mm-hmm. And my sister in it. My yeah. sister is a product. Of, it's a trickster society. And, but it's, it's a, masculine. It's, it does, that's a male, a closed male society that you got to. It's not really that. Cl- I mean, I don't remember it being closed. I mean, my mother did all kinds of shit that she wasn't supposed to do. She was, you know, people frowned on it. I just mean, I mean, the, you know, the, the idea of the liars club itself, right? Your daddy and his circle of friends in that time, in that place. They were all men. Yeah. All men drinking, drinking Lone Star beer in the back of the bait shop. But there's little Mary Carr at five years old who gets to be there with them. Who gets to be there and listen to them. That's right. So how does it change then when, when you get older? I mean, your relationship with your dad, I mean, you go through puberty. I, I, I assume you're not coming up, you're not showing up to the bait shop anymore. No, I mean, I was going to, you know, I was buying dope and, you know, bagging dope and trying to get the blotter acid salt so we could get money to for who tickets. You know, I was, yeah, I was enterprising. Doing the uh, important work of your, of, of that time <laughs> in that place. I know. Right. And uh, so, yeah, I think think that was it. But I also think I was reading books 
and trying to figure out how to get the hell out of there because I knew I was not suited to stay there, even though I was of that place. Yeah. I knew it was not, um, my, my opera, my horizons were limited by that place. And you weren't looking for a, a, a fella like that for like you Daddy? of that world. He was born in 1910. He was, you know, there's a great line. I just heard Joel Cohen say, quoting, uh, what's his name? Purvis, who wrote True Grit. You know, all the big shaggies are gone now. I mean, those guys were the big shaggies. I mean, they were like another. Legendary, a legendary generation. <laughs> just, yeah. I mean, you think about how tough they were. You think about how tough daddy was. When daddy would go out to work. I remember him going out in the middle of Hurricane Carla, the worst hurricane that that town ever saw, Mm -hmm. uh, including year to day. He went out in a jean jacket and 150 mile an hour wind with it raining sideways. I mean, tough, physically tough. Even as a as when you were younger. You saw the the beauty in that, and there's something about that that you kind of revered that this is this is the way a man. This is a great way for a man to be. I saw that stoicism and mm. I saw, and you've got to also understand, Daddy was also a mystery. I mean, just because of the place and time he was born and who he was. And you also have to remember he was in that war. So who the hell knows what happened over there? Who the hell knows who he was before that? I know that I've read, I've got all his letters. Yeah. And, um... In 1944, in the Ardennes Forest, he wrote, I'm, I'm too old to start a family now, I guess, but I had my day. He was 34 years old. Yeah. I'm too old to start a family now. And we were born over 10 years after that. Yeah. I'm just thinking about your dad and then, you know, you going off to graduate school and living in New England, living in Boston, being around poets and writers and artists and, you know, people who went to Yale, just a totally different kind of different archetypes of men that become that becomes your world, too. Oh, yeah. And yet you carry with you all this stuff from Texas. Right. And and the one version of, you know, this is what a, a good man looks like. This is what a good man can be. So does that ever create like tension? Well, you can imagine how many of these guys look like pussies. To me. <laughs> That's kind of what I'm getting at, Mary. I mean, come on. There's yeah. a reason I'm single. Um, <laughs> just sort of like, don't bring me this. What are you going to get out your OED and settle this up with me? Right? <laughs> Honey. I was the sissy though. I was not a tough girl. I was the, I was the I mean, I was mouthy, but I was not a hard ass. I was the one reading Shakespeare, you know. Yeah, but in New England, you're kind of a hard ass. Oh, no. I mean, I look, <laughs> I look scary in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Yeah, at Harvard College, I look really spooky. Yeah. I look like a tough girl and be in the right environment. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, let's talk about then you as a, as a parent. What is it like raising a boy, more or less as a, you know, as a single mom? Right. Is that is that is that no, fair to say? Um, yes, he was five years old. Sure. And I, obviously, Pete had had passed away before Dev was born. Correct. Right. So he doesn't know his his grandpa, but no. you're telling him stories about him. You're telling him the lore, right? Yeah, but it wasn't socially acceptable. Even even when he went to Radcliffe daycare, you know, when he was a baby. <laughs> You know, you couldn't like hit people. You, you couldn't let kids, little boys fight and hit each other. Yeah. But you like, wouldn't have wanted him to if even if he could, like you weren't trying to raise a little badass, you know, no, uh-huh. outlaw no, of a kid. My goal as a parent was unincarcerated. <laughs> you know, for you and him. A, yeah. HIV negative unincarcerated. <laughs> That's what we're both searching for. That big, that big double win. Uh-huh. Yeah. I mean, I didn't want, I was not a tough girl. But you have to also understand the other thing about my daddy is that he married my mother and he loved her. Yeah. He thought she was something. She was tough, too. Yeah. And and uh, so he liked that she was smart. It's funny. I just got off the phone with my sister's high school boy boyfriend, Belton Williams. Belton said, told that great story about Lisa shooting the raccoon at the top of that old loblolly pine. 
And he said, I said, did you, uh, you ever meet anybody else like Lisa? He says, nobody like Lisa. I wish I'd married her. Nobody could shoot like that. Nobody could hunt like that. Nobody could fish like that. Nothing she couldn't do. He said, but she was scary. Uh (laughs) And that's the thing about mother too. Mother was a little bit scary. I mean, you and your sister are both single moms in the 1980s. I'm just thinking about the different ways that you and her chose to think about shaping your sons. Yes. Right. Dev does not walk around talking about the legend of Pete Carr. The no, way Case does, right? Case is Case is a, a sort of ambassador for like like the car lore. He tells all those stories. He wants to sort of feel that um, that inheritance that as legend. part of his personality. Listen, Daddy was a legend. Yeah, and but Lisa, you know, she she intentionally. Oh, she cultivated that. She had him go out that first hog he shot, feral hog he shot who uh, David Harmon called him after they were divorced and said, you know, well, Case has just shot his first hog, and uh, I'd like to take him down here and get him taxidermy so you can hang him in his room. Lisa said, I don't care if he shot Kim Basinger out there. We are not hanging her head in my house. You know, so Lisa, Lisa had her limits, too. She didn't want any dead critters on her walls. But Daddy didn't have any dead critters in his. Daddy was an odd duck. Yeah. He was also emotional. He was emotionally, he was mostly very stoic, but he cried at, uh, when the flag went up at at the little league baseball game, Mm -hmm. he cried at Memorial day parades. He cried at funerals. He was very emotional. He was not, um, and super warm to me. Yeah. I've got letters from him. They all begin dear uh, to my heartbeat. Yeah. That, I mean, that, radiates from the pages of Liars Club, his warmth toward you, you know, the, the sweetness, the way that he dealt with you, the way he handled you. Do you ever, I mean, in thinking back to when Dev was little, did you ever sort of like have that moment where you go, oh, I'm doing my dad right now. I'm doing something that my dad would have done or said. I'm channeling him as a parent. Every, oh, wow. I think the love that I got in, in that house that was most solid was from daddy. Yeah. I think mother probably had an attachment disorder and Lisa, for whatever reason, chose mother or mother chose her and me and daddy were uh, the losers in the deal. But when I look back on it and I think about my life, I think we were very, there's only one time he ever scared me. Only one time. I mean, he scared me drinking and driving. You know, he never drew a sober breath and he drove all the time, like all, like everybody down there when I was growing up. But I remember saying to him after mother was right before mother, they took mother capital A away, you know, to the mental Marriott. Mm-hmm. I told him we were I remember we were going to pick May berries for Mayhaw jelly. And uh, we had a bunch of what is that? Bunch of it's a kind of berry that grows on a tree that's kind of sour like a persimmon, but you put a lot of sugar in it, it makes a nice jelly. We were picking mayhaw berries, and he said, uh, I said, Daddy, I don't want to stay with Mother. I don't like to stay with Mother when you go to work. And he said, what are you talking about? And I said, I think Mother's crazy. Hmm. And I was little, mm-hmm. you know, maybe big enough to be in school, uh, probably six or seven, right before she you know, had her nervous breakthrough. Yeah. And he pulled, I remember he pulled his truck over. He had a big green Ford pickup truck and he looked at me and he didn't touch me or anything. He said, if you talk, keep talking about your mother that way, I will slap you into next week. Mm. Now I knew he wasn't going to slap me. I wasn't afraid he would slap me, but it was scary for him to talk to me that way. Cause he didn't threaten you. Never. Uh, uh-uh. uh, if I walked out of school, I once walked out of school, like in the seventh grade, I just went home. It was, wasn't that far. It was a couple blocks. And I got in a fight with uh, my biology teacher. And um, I think that was when I went to the principal and I told the guy I wanted to be a poet. And he said, if you persist in this delusion that you'll be a poet, you'll wind up no more than a common prostitute. Wow. <laughs> I was in the seventh grade. I was like, you know, wow. 12 
12 years old. So I just went home. I walked out of the office. Instead of going back to my class, I went home. And I walked in, and Daddy had been working. Uh, and I woke him up when I came in. He says, Pokey, aren't you supposed to be in school? And I said, I had a fight with my biology teacher. I got sent to the principal. And I told him what I told the guy. And he said, uh, well, tell him to kiss your Texas ass. <laughs> you know, like, you know, fuck that guy. <laughs> you know, so. It's us against them here. It's us against them. Mm-hmm. That seemed normal to him for me to tell somebody to kiss my Texas And ass. you're in no danger of getting booted out of this thing, right? You're, you're here, you're ours, you're secure. Like he, he, exactly. Yeah. That's right. So pretty good to have a guy like that who's always on your side. That's right. And did you feel like you consciously tried to provide that to your son? Yeah. Yes. I remember Deb, Deb said a beautiful thing the other night. It was one of the great nights of my life. We had Terrence Hayes here for dinner made a big pot of gumbo. And a girlfriend of mine who's from Iran, grew up in Paris, talk, has met Deb, but doesn't really know him. And she said, what was your mother like? She must have been really strange. She must have been different hmm. than the other mothers. And he said, oh, yeah, she's the loudest person in every room, for one thing. Yeah, she was. She, she was. She was really different. He said, but I always knew that she loved me more than other people's mothers loved them. I knew that she was more on my side. And what I wanted to do was okay with her. Yeah. And that is not a gift from Charlie Carr. That is a gift from daddy. Mother was, didn't take much responsibility for correcting us. She wasn't that interested. So she had this detachment. Look, I'm not disparaging my mother. She gave me books and she, and she was there more than daddy. I mean, drunk as she was, Yeah. you know, he worked every day and, uh, you know, she wouldn't say suey if the hogs were eating her. You know, <laughs> she was lazy. So she was at home most of the time. Mother gave me everything in the way of books, music, philosophy, poetry, intellectual conversation, theater, mm-hmm. symphony, opera. The life of the mind. The life of the mind. But daddy was a, a poet after a fashion, just like uh, a lot of people down there are. Raining like a cow pissing on a flat rock. Nothing better than that. Mary Carr, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm so proud to be on Padre. You going to teach me how to make gumbo? Hell to the yes. Come on up here. I'm coming on down. I'm going to come on down. Come on down. And uh, to I've, the got big a, city. I've got a black skillet. We'll get some... Uh, cast iron? Is that what you... Cast iron. Hell to the yes. <laughs> get some Crisco going. Okay. Is that lard? Are we cooking with lard? I've got the lard for you, honey. All right. Hi, who are you? Nico. You're Nico. What do you want to say to the audience? I don't know. You don't know? I like waffles so much. We're coming to the end of our program. And that means it's time for the Not a Terrible Father in This One Instance Award, where we recognize one particular father who did something that wasn't terrible. This week's winner is someone really special. In keeping with this episode's exploration of the theme of mentorship, the prize is going to a man named John Harvey. I first met John in 2001 when I was a skinny, chain-smoking freshman at the University of Houston, and he was a youngish professor, wild-haired poet, playwright of the macabre and avant-garde, impresario, and father. He had two mostly grown kids. They were about my own age back in Michigan, but he married the wonderful writer in person, Gabriela Maya, while I was still his student. And they soon had young Damien. John and I became better and better friends over the years. And after I finished grad school, he helped me get my first big job back there with him at my alma mater, the University of Houston Honors College. 
And for a few really sweet years, we got to be colleagues. And he got to be there when I became a father. Eventually, John and Gabriella moved their family to Sweden, and they've been there ever since. But John and I still talk on just about every Saturday morning. And like we've been doing for more than 20 years now, we compare notes. We make each other laugh. He helps me make sense of this surreal and sometimes macabre world. He told me a story recently that, though it's an old one, more than merits recognition with a Nat Fatwa Award. Yeah, spell it out. We're doing the acronym. Anyway, let's give him a call before it gets too late in Stockholm. Chris, how you doing? Why, John Harvey, I presume. Oh, my. My, is that a foghorn, leghorn? John Harvey, I do declare. That is you calling me. Um, John I, Harvey. I, I take it it's light where you are. I'm in the midst of Swedish darkness. Uh, let, let the darkness engulf you while you eat some herring. Do you know what Julian Herring. said to me yesterday on the walk what? home from school? He goes, we were walking around the corner and there was a pile of trash because we, we live in a city. And in the pile of trash was a book that like a paperback book that had been like torn in half. And there were a few loose pages on the ground and he stopped and he kind of read it, but he looked at it really quickly. And then we kept walking and he goes, you know what that book said? And I said, what? And he goes, people who eat darkness. Mm will die from darkness. I go, are you fucking serious? Like, did it really say that? And he goes, no, I just made that up. That came from inside Julian. That came from inside Julian. And it's, I mean, we all eat darkness. I mean, that's, it's like we're eating darkness every day. Now, I think I'm eating a little bit more darkness here of the, of the what's in the sky sense. But uh, yeah, that's good. I mean, he can you, handle. Did I you mean, talk like? Did Damien talk like that as a seven-year-old? Damien, Damien had would have would have bursts of of fantastic wisdom. Um, yeah, just observations about you know existence. But yeah. did he speak it, like a French existentialist? Well, no, it was more like a conjuring alchemist because early on, <laughs> like he moved into Pokemon and magic, and so he'd be mm-hmm. wandering through the house pondering on the combinations of fire and forests and stone and water. And so, yeah, it was like living with a, a druid that's maybe discovered Carl Jung and is trying mm-hmm. some shit out. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, speaking of Damien, John, you know, he's a great kid. He yeah. always has been. Yes. Uh, he was always, he was great with my kids when they were born and they were little Right. Um, so he's, he's now, uh, he's, he's basically off to college, right? He's, or he's on the threshold. Well, he's finishing high school this year and then he's going to take a gap year to learn Swedish and then most likely go to a Swedish university. You only need a certain level of Swedish to get in and he, mm-hmm. and he can attain that level in a year because most of the classes are going to be in English. Um, because really, you know, I mean, certainly around Stockholm and Southern Sweden, it's an English speaking country. Um, this yeah. might end up getting my Swedish citizenship revoked, but it, it really is. Well, um, something will eventually. I mean, you, you, would, you, know, right. you wouldn't hold your breath, John. Um, I've called you for a particular reason. And of course, you know, here we are uh, on, on Padre. And as you and really everyone at this point is well aware, Padre has the honor of bestowing once an episode, the Not a Terrible Father in this one instance award. On one particular father, you know, Sweden's got the Nobel, um, but we have this. It may come as a surprise to you, but you are this week's recipient of the Not a Terrible Father in this one oh, yeah. instance award. Oh, that's so honored. Go ahead. Take a minute. Yeah. Take a I'm, minute. I'm just so honored. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's. Well, you know, you and I were talking uh, recently and you, uh, we were talking, of course, about our, our boys and, um. And you told me a story that that really hit home for me and really kind of rang some familiar chords. And I wonder if if uh, I'm, I'm talking about the story that you told me about Damien when he was little, just mm-hmm. the other day. And if if you would just kind of tell that story again. Wow. Okay. Well, again, thank you, thank you very much. Um, it's uh, it's 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 great to be on Padre and and to receive this um, distinction. Damien, when he was young, we're living in Houston. 
you know, Gabriel and I take them to, to the parks where there are plenty of sticks, wood chips, dirt, sometimes syringes, but you know, we try to push those out of the way. Um, and Damien loved to play with sticks and stones and dirt and create various assemblages uh, as if he's being moved in some ritualistic fashion by the old gods. Um, and he would place them in, in, in a certain array. And pretty regularly, he'd, he'd want us to take a picture of them. And sometimes that would suffice. But more often than not, he wanted to take them home with him. Mm. Uh, all the sticks, all the dirt, all the stones. And so... Um, Dirty, you know, sharp pine cones and Pine cones sticks. and, you know, worms oh. are there somewhere and stuff. Muddy, and, muddy little rocks, just little fucking rocks. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and bits of grass, old desiccated leaves. And, you know, at, at first it's like, oh, uh, sure, okay. Right. And and so at, at a certain point, you know, the, the back seat floor of my car and Gabrielle's car, it piled with sticks and stones and dirt mm -hmm. and leaves mm -hmm. and grass. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just on the back car seat because he'd like to sit there and look at it like this is his world and to touch it. And, but at a certain point, you know, the, I was raised in the Midwest by parents of German ancestry mm -hmm. who kept things clean they might mm -hmm. be at one another's throats mm -hmm. but things were clean yeah i mean that definitely coming through my mother uh and and my grandmother uh whose voices are always with me uh death is not the end and and so there's kind of this this inner judge within me that's going to mean this is this is horrible i mean this the people are going to think we're 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 trolls um yeah and of how course as, as how can you live like this you know, there's there's sticks right. and mud and dirt Right. on surfaces where people are supposed to sit down. Right, right. And, and as with many things, uh, a conversation with Gabriella um, brings me to insight. And I guess, I guess finally the insight was, um, you know, I think she kind of dropped the word play. Mm. You know, and, um, and, and, I, and I, I remember thinking, yeah, the playfulness of mess. Mess. And, there was, and all of a sudden, like the inner kid in me, somewhere back there, uh, rose up and threw off the shackles of cleanliness and said, mm. yes, yes, Damien needs his playful mess. Mm. Um, and so at, at that point, it was like, it wasn't just fine. It's like, okay. And so mm. playing with him in the dirt and making sure it was, it was, it was gathered in and that the mounds grew higher. And, and sometimes mm. when, when a, a friend would need a ride like home from, from U of H or something. And, and, yeah. you know, they were about to get in the car and they looked in the back seat and could see, you know, the, the detritus of, of the world strewn there. <laughs> uh, and they were like, what, what is this? Don't you clean out your car? And, and the voice came out of me going, that is Damien's sacred sticks and stones and yeah. dirt. And it will stay there and you can go fucking take the bus. Yeah. Take the fucking bus which if here. you've lived in houston you know that's really you don't want to no do that. option yeah that's a big that. that's a that's a yeah. huge threat so I, th I think that that is the moment because it was like this connection of 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 the kid in me with with, with the kid that 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 damien was and then like raising the fist for for sacred mess sacred dirt I, li I love that i love that also the way that it kind of it's almost a synthesis because you you know you, you described kind of getting sort of kneeling down to his level and imagining like being a three or four or five year old boy yeah. um, and, and how just this sort of lights up his imagination. And that requires the sort of imaginative leap into his point of view. Right. Uh, and that's the first part of it. But the second part of it is, is very grown up. It's very adult John who likes to think about the relationship of, of the sacred to the human, the sacred to the natural world, you know, all of the things that, that you write and teach and, uh, and have been talking about and thinking about for your whole adult life. And there's a beautiful way that those, both of those kind of merge in one action of, um, of grace, right. Of like, this is going, yeah, this is okay. This is, yeah. this is okay. Um, yeah. Well, I'm going to, yeah, that's the word.
Yeah, That's the it's word. beautiful. So it, it's well deserving of this highly sought after and prestigious and mysterious award. You know, I would say. Yeah, well, I I will have it. I mean, that really is all that's that's needed on my tombstone. Not that I'm going to have a tombstone that will be with me when I am pushed out in the bark into the Baltic. Yeah. For me to travel to your whole body or your ashes, because I always thought I would have like at least like a thimble full of you to kind of wear in a locket. Um, oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah. it's just like, like a I don't know, like a like a like a limb, something you know, just like a little bit of John. Yeah, but yeah, if, like you're, a... if you're planning on doing a kind of burial at sea, then I don't know. I mean, I guess that's your prerogative. You like give me like one of your old pairs of shoes or something. I don't know. Right, right, or or maybe you know before they push me out and uh, like like borrow mirror from the Fellowship of the Rings, mm-hmm, they mm-hmm. they could hack off you know maybe a, a finger I don't know or uh, ooh like or, Banshees of Energy. Have you watched the Banshees movie, the Martin McDonough, the newest one? It's uh, I have I not. Give any, I don't want to give anything away. Then we'll we'll leave that aside. But d- let me ask you this: Do you still have any? Any keepsake from that kind of period of Damien's life where he was the gatherer and the collector? Do you think he still... I mean, I I would say that this epiphany of mess that occurred to me, that should have always occurred to me, given... given, Don't judge yourself. Don't judge yourself. You be a friend to yourself. Okay. Okay. Be a friend of myself. But this has kind of continued. So like Damien's room, like we do keep the house clean, right? You always have to dust your bookshelves, Chris. Just remember that. You always, you things don't. are fine if you dust your bookshelves. But Damien's room is off limits. It is in the state of, of what it's going to be. When, it, when his girlfriend comes over, we try to encourage him to Whoa. clean it up a bit. But I would not be surprised if somewhere back in there, there's a stick. <laughs> there's a, there's I do still, there's I mean, stone. Julian is seven and I'm still, every now and then I will find like a, yeah, like like I'm going through his pockets when I'm doing the laundry, and I'm like, okay, they, we're still doing this a little bit. It's not like it was when he was three, four, or five, when there'd be a pile of it on the doorstep or in the car or or in the car seat. But every now and then, I'm like, okay, we got a rock. A right. rock is in his pocket. Right. <laughs> I'm like, do you want yeah. to keep this? Can I give this back to you? And I and I brought this up to him recently. You know, do do you remember this? It's a fun thing to play with your. You know, he's about to turn eighteen. Your your older children. You know, do you remember? you know, when you did this or you did that and, you know, such part of their identity for you and the belief that, well, they're always that really, they're always that. And he had, he had a dim recollection of it, but he smiled. It was like, it gave him Hmm. joy to, oh Hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, now that he he was smiling because he, he, he still connects with that experience or that because he sees what it means to you and he's yeah, smiling yeah. at your sort of fatherly love glee. and affection for him. Yeah, yeah. It's glee. It's like, it's just the kind of, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think both, I think, yeah, yeah. and that, and that my bring it up and Gabriella bring it up kind of reconnects him to that past as well. Cause it's, it's interesting, like what slips away. Right. And, and so like as, as a parent, it's interesting and and sad and and yeah. and bizarre, frankly. What slips right. away? How much of childhood just goes by for the child with no permanence, right? In their in their actual memory, um, right. whereas we are documentarians as right. their parents, right? We remember all of it, and we uh, we can still see it. We can still see them collecting yeah. those sticks yeah. in the dirt, and they're like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> like right. it wasn't. Well, consciousness is is devilry. And and it really mm. shouldn't have happened, but yeah. but memories like there is how little time we often spend in the present of wherever we are, and and how much of it, and maybe as we get older, even more is is spent in this remember time, um, and the remember time can actually become our idea of who our child is. We can just hang on to it. No, this is. This is who you are, and it's it's that difficulty of realizing, well, n- not so much really, and who he is now, we don't have the same access to. He is to mm. have his own private thoughts and meditations, and mm. and he's kind of gone on, and so, um, yeah, the um, wow, and this with 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 Nicholas and Kelsey as well. This holding on to, but this is who you were. And of course, as time goes, it, it shifts and it reforms. And, um, 
you know, becomes this very precious thing that we have, but it's, it's, it's status of reality. Um, is is questionable, and maybe it's it's more this uh, this sign of love, closer to a to a work of arts reality, right? No. Than uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. than that of a of okay. a living, breathing human being who's right next to you, um, and has agency and can change in the moment. Yeah, there's a real beauty to that, and it's but it's also just it's a bittersweet one, right? It's, it's bittersweet. Uh, it's bittersweet. Yeah, it's the old on a Grecian urn. I mean, yes, to have forever right of course with keats poem the two lovers who are about to kiss but never kiss but they're always there they're always lovers or to have the thing that's real but will will alter right um and uh, i guess the idea of having both that you can you see your your child growing up and and you marvel at it and he becomes in, in some sense a stranger but at the same time you have this, this this memory and so yeah you kind of shape something that that you hope doesn't distort them and you too much um but that you kind of want to set your mark on and said so there there was this moment there was this time john harvey you were a good father and <laughs> a good man and a good friend thank you for coming on padre well all those uh back at you sir I first met you when you were, I think you were only 18, 18 right? 18. When you were in uh, my human sick class. And, and from the very moment, and, and possibly this is where Julian gets it, you were, you were out to make your mark and you would be heard and you would be seen. <laughs> and you are, and that is a very good thing in the world. Thanks, John. We'll talk yeah. to you soon. Okay. <laughs> That's all for our show today. Join us next time when Padre gets dark. We're going to eat some darkness together, and it's going to be delicious. I'm going to tell some stories that I probably shouldn't tell. And novelist Daniel Magarl, my dear Danny boy, is coming on the pod. You don't want to miss it. Padre is created and produced by me, Chris Brunt. Original artwork for the show is by David Wojo. Special thanks to Brad Franco and Julian and Nico Benz-Brunt.